I can have another four groups continue, contribute to the next lesson. Another group of four contribute to the lesson. I can make sure that every child every week contributes in getting knowledge ready. I can be, I can be strategic as a teacher, can't I? I can know which kids I ask. And I can have my plan. I'm, going to talk, I'm not going to wait for... I'm not going to ask the kids to put up their hand all the time. Those of you who've watched me teach, no, I don't do that. I'm going to pick who I want to respond. And I'm going to want every child to respond every week. I think it's only fair. If they're coming to a class, they might as well have something to say. So, no, I'd be really pushing this individual differences. I believe, I believe that Teacher B is much more in control of the learning in the class than Teacher A. And if we take on board the third one, imagine at the beginning of the class, some kids come in, there's little Jennies in the class who are really confident about learning about SOAPs, the verbal gushers. And they're, no, they're a little, who's the other guy? Peter. Who's the other guy? Freddie. Freddie. Little, there, are, there are little Freddies in the class. Now, at the end of the class, in Teacher A, in Teacher A's class, the little Jennies know they're good students. The little Freddies know they're hopeless students. In this teacher's class, is there a chance that the little Freddie will have contributed? You bet there is. I've seen it again and again. I've seen it so often when I've been teaching. In the first few minutes, a child will be really reluctant. And as the lesson goes on, and you've given a bit of feedback to that child, it's changed. And the child is in there, and at the end, really, and teachers often remark, hey, you know, some of those kids who had problems are really, you know, we're right into it at the end. So I would argue that I can have, through the queuing, children feeling much better about themselves, much more confident about that topic, about learning with me. And I've got no control over how they learn with anyone else. But if they feel confident about learning with me, that's all that matters to me, you know. I'd argue that the queuing can really take care of this individual differences. And my reason for saying it, in the area of learning difficulties, you know, learning disabilities, dyslexia and whatever, one key concept is the notion of the non-strategic learner. The kids who, uh, uh, another word for it is passive learners, they're not passive by any means. But uh, they're, they're passive in how they learn. And we've known this for 20 or 30 years, that there are some kids who spontaneously don't engage how to learn strategies. And I can either ignore that or else I can scaffold them to do it. And I believe it's through the scaffolding that I can engage those kids. So there's a real scientific reason for doing this. Yeah, and it's it's. it's yeah, but I can still I can do that in a. Um, what I'm wanting to say is I can do that in a group of children, at at Thomastown West. And some of you heard me talk about the lesson I, I was asked to take a lesson at Thomastown West on poetry, and the poem we were, and it was to show the kids uh, how you know how you can comprehend poetry, and uh, the poem that the kids were reading was I love a sunburnt country, now. That's not an easy, if you think of t some of you, I mean, uh, um, Maria, you're from Thomastown. Who's from Thomastown? You're from Thomastown? You have to now, you, you know what, what, the, what the children are like, you know, in that area. I mean, you know, I love a sunburned country. may not be a familiar concept to all the kids in Thomastown. So I had to do something. I love a sunburned country. We all read it together, and I had to get them to imagine, to visualise what it looks like being sunburned. When you're sunburnt, what do you look like? You're red, you're peeling, your skin's cracking. What would a sunburnt country look like? All green and lush? Oh, all rocks and red and cracking. A land of sweeping plains. And as I've said to I think some of you before, as I was reading it, I heard the aircraft going over. And I thought, when these kids read at Thomastown West, a land of sweeping plains, <laughs> on the approach to Tullamarine. <laughs> so we all did the action, the sweeping planes. What is sweeping? It's the, it's the wheat all sweeping. 
That's the land sweeping. We all did it a few times. We had to do, so I had, see, I had to cue them to do the action. Then of ragged mountain ranges. And I, we'd already said there was a difference between poetry and you know, um, narrative of prose. And there was one of the differences. In two sentences, you can have opposites. And we stopped and talked about that. But my, my point is I had to cue the kids to do that. Now, I would do that cueing in any class. If I were again teaching a secondary class, I would be doing cueing. I may not be having all the kids do the ragged mountains or the sweeping plains, but the actions, and you know, you know really well, Lord, the actions deliver the knowledge. And then, of course, when we got to um, of droughts and flooding rains, before I could say anything, Mr Munro, another contrast, which was good. But um, the, the point is, if I do that cueing, I'm actually taking account of individual differences. Whereas if I don't do it, I'm not. And you see, I, I really feel, I, I feel very strongly about these because and the thing I, the, the one of these that I feel strongest about is number three. Because kids will come into the class knowing they're hopeless and damn it all, they'll leave the class knowing they're hopeless. And that's not fair. I mean, it's not... If I can do things in the intervening moments for them to leave the class knowing they know, have learned more, then that's really what I'm being paid to do. Is this all right? I can't see any other way of catering for individual differences while there's one teacher and there's a range of ways of thinking than this. I, I, I don't believe that A is really a good teacher. I'm sorry. And when we think of the word educate, you know, educate, duco, I lead. What about small groups? You, you, can have, you can have the children in small groups if you want. But I'm wanting to say as well, I can do this on a large group. I can do it just as well in a large group situation. Sorry, not... Sorry, Clive. I'm not matching the children to text that they can do. At this point, yes, I am doing one size fits all. I am. Because what I'm wanting the kids to do is to experience uh, applying a range of strategies at once. It, 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 it really could be. Now, we know that some children are going to be more able to uh, apply these strategies. They're going to have richer vocabulary. They'll be able to work on text at a higher level than others. But at least I can have the group at various times work together, experience the learning, and really uh, experience actually building the knowledge. And I think it's really important. I think it's critical. So at this point, I'm not matching children to text. I'm believing I can, I can be a Vygotskian and I can apply the scaffolding to lead all the children along. I don't need to have lower level instruction for the children who don't have the knowledge at that point. I can scaffold it. 